All right. Uh, Debbie, I don't think she made it into the meeting tonight. Uh, John had an issue this past week where he had a seizure and he had to go to the hospital. They were uh, reducing his um, steroids and it probably caused a seizure. So he went to the hospital for a day or two. He just got home yesterday, I think. So they're not really feeling up to it tonight for the meeting. Um, I don't see Harry. I don't think we have anything for NJFCC. There's nothing until the fall anyway. Uh, Melinda said she had something to say, I think. No, nothing for PSA. Okay, no results yet. Uh, the only thing I have to say is our gallery show is running at the Gorgon. Um, it was actually extended until uh, June 16th, so we're going to leave our images up until then. If you haven't gone and seen it, go ahead and see it. Uh, Monday to Friday, they're open 9 to 4, I believe. It's municipal building hours, whatever their hours are. Um, and, yeah, we had like 40 people come out the first day, so that was nice at the opening. Good to see everybody. Um, now we'll move on to Valerie. Oh, actually, uh, Wayne had something to talk about for his show, and we'll show his uh, thing here as soon as I find the right mouse. Here's Wayne. Yeah, hey, everybody. So we're real happy to have uh, an exhibit at the uh, Plainsboro Library uh, in the Plainsboro Town Center. This is it. Um, I'm exhibiting along with Lynn Padwe, uh, Rich Polk, and Michael Padwe. Um, it's running through um, June 24th, and we've got a reception coming up on the 13th. That's this coming Saturday from 1 to 3. So I hope you can all make it. Thank you, Wayne. And here's Valerie with our speaker who is in person. Okay, before we get to Chris, I want to say <clears throat> in June, we are going to have Rose, our very own Rose. She's going to give a presentation for basic Lightroom. It's going to be step by step from importing an image to exporting an image and everything in between. You will be shown what you should do to every image before you start any extras or working with it in another program. And after you go through that, it'll be a PowerPoint presentation and it will have um, time for question and answers. So be ready to learn something next month. Yay. And this month we have Chris. Chris used to be a member. We're hoping he'll, he'll come back and rejoin us. No pressure there, Chris. <laughs> okay. But, um, in 2016, Chris retired after more than 20 years as a president and, and CEO of the Universal Behavior Health Healthcare, a division of Rutgers University. His responsibilities included management of one of the largest academic behavioral health um, system in the country, as well as oversight of all medical and mental health services in New Jersey state prison system. Since he was a child though, Chris has been res um, fascinated by the beauty and complexity of nature and has attempted to memor memorialize what he sees through photography. He has had the opportunity to travel extensively and has focused on wildlife adventures in Arctic, Africa, South America, and of course, North America. Upcoming travels include, what is it? Brazil. I'm not going to try to mention the Pantanel. I know I messed that up. I was bad in Colombia too. Um, <laughs> Australia. There's another city somewhere in Norway I can't pronounce, and Antarctica. Swarward. Okay. He's an avid scuba diver, uh, working hard to improve his underwater photography skills while not drowning. But tonight, <laughs> always a plus. We want to make sure we we keep you coming back. But tonight, Chris is going to do his presentation on. Um, South Africa. So we're really looking forward to seeing all, all the pictures and hearing about the country and what he had to do to get some of these wonderful images. So welcome, Chris. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, fun to be here. Uh,
How's that? Okay, good. It's still a pleasure to be here. And, uh, and um, so I'm going to go through, and you'll see in just a second, where these photographs have been taken. Um, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Africa now. And so let's see. Huh. There we go. That's the continent. And these are the countries where these photographs are going to come from. There are a number of uh, four different trips to Africa. And uh, so that's that's the array of countries where these photos have been taken. Um, if you have any questions about where some of them are taken, I don't identify which country each is from, but I can certainly happy to tell you if you want to ask. So there we go. Um, there, there really are a few places on Earth, I think, that have the photographic opportunities that Africa pre presents. Uh, but there are also some real challenges to photography in Africa, and I'm going to go through some of them right now. Okay. So many subjects are born to run. Uh, they're very fast. These are Thompson's gazelles. And uh, it's purposely blurred, um, but you can get a sense of that. There's a saying in Africa that uh, never run when you're in Africa because only food runs. Um, and uh, things like gazelle and impalas uh, do a lot of running. It can be very challenging to get good photography with them. And then... Some some animals seem to be waiting for you to put on a show. Huh. This was one of those magical moments. This is in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. And we there were two female lions, uh, and they had each had three cubs. And there was this log across. All of a sudden, one of the one of the uh lion cubs jumps up on the log and the other five follow it and are just sitting there staring at us and it was an incredible moment um just amazing that that seems a little out of focus is is there yeah it, it's it's not a blurry picture um actually we were no 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 it's, I don't know. Yeah, does that look clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, probably 20, 25 feet. But one of the things in Africa, and it's something I'll talk about in just a second, is, you know, you can't be out, you can't be unprotected. So in Africa, we're in the cages, you know, and the animals are free uh, because the, the moms were right there. They're not in the picture, but the moms were there, and there's no way that they would want you, you know, walking around near their cubs. Uh, that wouldn't happen. Uh, it wouldn't happen for very long anyway. Uh, hang on, there we go. Okay. So s some animals have crappy attitudes, like him. Uh, that's a... Um, that's a superb, uh, a superb starling, um, beautiful bird. And I just love the expression on his face. Um, and uh, some animals can interfere with your travel plans. This is a real picture. Um, that was a runway we had just landed on, a, a dirt strip, and there's an elephant. You can see him crossing right there. And the plane that was our plane was going to take off and couldn't until the elephant decided to vacate the runway. And then, of course, others may want to eat you. Um, so these are some of the hazards of photography in Africa. Actually, this is a, a, a picture I'd like to just make a quick comment about. This is one of the few pictures that I regret I ever took. Uh, and I regret I ever took it because I shouldn't have been there. We were in a vehicle and our guide, who's a friend of mine, um, 
Fulgens, you'll see a picture of him later on, got too close to this male lion. And we were intruding in his space. And he was really pissed off. And uh, and we had no right to be there. This was truly a, a, a bad situation. Not that we were at any risk, but we shouldn't have been disturbing him that way. And he was uh, unabashed in letting us know we were disturbing him, <laughs> as you can see. So let's take a look at some of the more mundane challenges of safari uh, photography. Uh, the nearest camera store may be hundreds of dirt road miles away. This is not my photograph, nor is it my camera. Um, but this is this actually happened to me. My first, my first African safari, the second day of the safari, I had put my camera case on the hood of our our uh, land our Land Cruiser and was taking something out of it. And I closed the top and I didn't zip it. And I then went to grab my camera case and everything fell off, fell out of the case into dirt. And it was this incredibly fine dirt. And I was, I did not have so much money then. And I have one body, a Nikon body, and I have one zoom lens and that was on the camera. And this fine dirt jammed the zoom lens. And I had a small brush with me and I worked on it for about an hour and a half. And I finally got the lens to operate again. But it was a, an instructive lesson to me because we were out in the middle of nowhere and there was nowhere to get more camera equipment. I really thought that I wasn't gonna be able to take any photographs. And it was on our second day of a 12 day safari. Uh, it, it was heartbreaking, and I really got very lucky, but um, it's it's one of the dangers. You're in such a remote area. Now, the other, this is an interesting one. So this picture is obviously a really crappy picture, um, and I put it in here intentionally because one of the problems is in most national parks in Africa, you can only go out from sunrise to sunset, and in the time that I always go, which is in our summertime, their winter, around, uh, you know, uh, July, August, September, um, you get a lot of incredibly bright, hot days, even though it's their winter, it's still hot. And here the three lions are seeking shade because it's so damn hot out. And you get this overexposure. I mean, it's it's really a problem of dealing with it. So the 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 best solution is a graduated neutral density filter. Uh, so that's like the go-to filter there because you can cut down some of the glare of the sun uh, in the sky while still getting the animals that are on the ground. But it's a constant battle. You get very harsh shadows uh, because a lot of them are taken in, you know, around noontime. A lot of the photographs are taken around noontime. And you'll see some that aren't. Uh, we'll get to some of the photographs that aren't. But that's a real problem in Africa. Another big problem is, you know, this was one of the vehicles we were in. And so all of the shooting pretty much is done from that. You stand up and you can shoot down, but you're always shooting down. And as you know, I'm sure you're all familiar. It's, it's often not the best way to shoot animals um, is shooting down on them. So that that's a, a problem. And you really can't fix that there. Uh, there are times when you can get out of the vehicle but often not when you're around animals that you really want to take pictures of. Um, it's not safe. There are some vehicles that are built a little bit differently that have open sides here. They have certain advantages and disadvantages. Um, one of the disadvantages is often the roads are very dusty. And here you can close it up quickly if you're going on a dusty road and the camera equipment gets coated with dust, you get coated with dust. Often, this was before COVID. Uh, actually, no, this picture was not before COVID. This was after COVID. But uh, we used to wear masks in the vehicles, the open vehicles, because it was so dusty in there on some of the roads. Uh, so that's a problem you deal with often there. Um, that's not my photograph. But uh, there's very. this is a very common plane. That's a Cessna 208, a caravan. And this is kind of a, a, a regular bush plane in Africa. Uh, it's a turboprop. Um, and the baggage limits are severe. 
uh, you're allowed, you know, on all of these internal flights, you're allowed 50 pounds of baggage total. Uh, that includes your clothing and your equipment. My camera bag that I bring to Africa weighs about 35 pounds. So I start smelling pretty bad after a few days. Um, can't bring many clothes. Uh, and uh, so that is a problem. The travel in Africa internally uh, has strict limits on weight because of the planes that they're using. Um, so that's something you're always dealing with. So these must be enough excuses to cover the shortcomings of my photographs that you're about to see. Um, I'm hoping there's enough excuses anyway. So let's take a look at some of the pictures from Africa. Um, you know, again, if you look here, you can see that sky. This is a constant sky that you get. And, you know, you can replace the sky and make it look really cute. Uh, I never do that. I, I just don't think it, it just strikes me as wrong. This is the way it is. It's a bright sky. You can tone it down a little bit with Lightroom so that it's not blinding you when you look at the photograph. But that's the way the sky is. Um, but, you know, you know, it's just terrific. And one of the reasons I took this picture is because giraffes have very special mouths. Their favorite food is a thorny acacia. It's a tree with huge, very sharp thorns. And their lips and their tongue are specially constructed so that, that they don't get punctured by these, these, um, uh, these thorns on the, on the acacias. And they pick the leaves out from between these thorns and eat it. It's really quite something. Uh, they're an amazing animal. Uh, they're just, they're, they're one of the most improbable animals in the world, I think. I, I love the giraffes. There's a, I've, I've put, I put the names on most of the pictures of unusual animals, just so you know what they are. Normally, I wouldn't want to, you know, interrupt the photograph with that, but I thought it might be useful. So this is a blue-eared blue starling. They're very common. This is not a rare bird in Africa. It's very common, but they're spectacular, uh, just spectacular. I, I actually don't know a lot about birds particularly, but I sure love them. And one of my challenges when I'm anywhere is to take picture, pictures of birds, and particularly I like to try and get them in flight uh, because it's a challenge to get a good picture of a bird in flight. Um, this isn't one of those challenges, however. <laughs> um, this is a common animal, the black-backed jackals. You see them a lot. They're scavengers. And whenever a lion or a leopard or a cheetah makes a kill, you'll very soon see jackals hanging out, trying to get some of the leftovers. Um, here, they're just talking to each other peacefully. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite pictures, actually. Um, this is in the Serengeti in, in uh, Tanzania. And I like this because it gives you a sense of what the Serengeti looks like. And it places this big male lion in his environment. Um, you know, it's really tempting. And I have lots of pictures that are close-ups of lions, like the one you saw. And you'll see some more. It's always tempting to take a close-up so you can really see the animal clearly. But it's also, I, oops, 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 sorry. Sorry, we're going back, I hope. There we go. No. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, it's, it's really nice to see the animal in his natural environment and get a sense of what the Serengeti looks like. And this is exactly what the Serengeti looks like. It's, um, it's got these granite outcroppings and there's usually a pride of lions that hangs out near these, uh, granite outcroppings because animals seek shelter there and the lions prey on them. Uh, so you often see lions and leopards hanging out in these outcroppings and they're all over in the Serengeti. It's really a, a, just a stunning environment. And I really like seeing the lion there, uh, you know, in his natural environment. This is an unusual animal. This is a bat-eared fox, uh, aptly named, I think. Uh, not a very common animal. You don't see them often. I think there are plenty of them around. They're just not out very often. I think they're nocturnal hunters. Um, 
which is a whole other thing. In the national parks, as I mentioned earlier, you're not allowed to be out at night uh, in the parks. That's to protect the animals from getting run over by vehicles and to allow them to do their hunting. Uh, so in most of the national parks, you can't be out at night. So you don't see a lot of things like bat-eared foxes. This is an extremely common uh, monkey, uh, the black-faced uh, vervet monkey. They're all over in southern and eastern, uh, eastern Africa. I'm sorry. Yeah, eastern Africa. They're all over. You see them commonly. And they can, they can really cause hell if they get into your tent. Uh, they love shiny objects, and they'll go through all of your possessions. I've known several people who have left their tent unzipped, and uh, these guys. Take it. Um, they're characters, and they're, they're very common. Uh, this is a beautiful. Uh, this is the alpha male of a pride and one of the females. Um, and this was uh, getting close to sunset, so you don't have that awful lighting. Uh, you have this beautiful uh, golden lighting, uh, just a beautiful time of day. It's very lucky. You know, that's part of the thing is, you know, these animals are doing their thing, and you're just lucky to get them uh, doing whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. 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 This That one, hang on, I'll go back. Yeah, it was a good eye. Um, this was this was from one of those open vehicles, so I was lower to the ground in it. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, great pickup on that one. Yeah, much, much closer to ground level. Um, and we're very close to, this is a really common guy. See, and this is a male. This is a male gamma lizard. And the colors are just spectacular. This is completely unretouched color-wise. Uh, this is their natural color. Their hind end is all that incredible blue. And I don't know what to call that color, but it's just spectacular. They're very common. But it's one of the joys of being in different countries is you see things that you don't see here. You know, they're just uh, around. For years, this was the only leopard I had ever seen. This is a... a, a, a a young female leopard and uh, she was hanging out. She had just had a kill and uh, she was tired. And uh, I got a bunch of shots of her. It was a really thrilling time. I've since seen many other leopards, uh, but she, they're just gorgeous animals. I have a shot of a leopard later. You'll see that it's one of my favorite wildlife shots I've ever taken. This, of course, is the hippos. I like the lighting on this one um, with the water. And hippos are notoriously ill-tempered animals. Uh, they actually, okay, here's a test. What animal kills the most people in Africa? No, they're number two. Hippos are number two. Num number one, I'm sorry, no. Yep, mosquitoes, that's it. Mosquitoes kill over a million people a year in Africa uh, with the diseases they carry. Hippos kill about 30 people, and they're number two. Um, lions are right around the same number as hippos. Uh, they, they don't kill that many people. Yeah, they're fighting. They, they always fight. Hippos are scarred all over from fighting. Uh, they fight constantly. Um, it's really amazing to watch them. And you can see his teeth. Um, those are his teeth. They're huge. They're three to four inches long. And their their hides are covered with uh, scars from fighting. And they feed, when they're in the water, almost all the time, their feet are on the ground. They're very bad swimmers because they're too heavy. And so they, they're in water, but they're, uh, they keep their feet on the ground almost all the time. And they come out at night when it's cooler. They can't tolerate much the heat because they're so fat. And they come out at night, and at night they graze. They're, they, they're, not, they're not carnivorous. They're herbivores. But uh, they're also very bad-tempered animals. And so 
hippos are a good thing to keep a distance from. This was, this was a beautiful experience. We went out right at about 5.30 in the morning one morning with my guy, Fulgens, um, and he thought he knew where there was going to be a cheetah. And he was right. There was a cheetah out there just as the sun was coming up. And that's, that's an acacia tree, which is kind of the symbolic African tree. Um, it was just a wonderful morning uh, to see that cheetah. Cheetahs are very hard to find. Um, they're generally solitary, although sometimes they'll hunt in twos or threes. They're relatives. They stay together. But they're hard to find, uh, but they're fascinating animals. They're probably my favorite African animal. Cheetahs have some real interest in human beings. And so a cheetah will sit there and look you right in the eye. And I have some pictures of that. Uh, they're really interesting. They seem really interested in people, uh, unlike most of the animals. This is, I, I just love zebras. You know, it takes a second to figure out how many zebras are here. There are actually three. That's a, that's a young one there. Uh, but they're just, you know, again, their coloring is so improbable. And most people don't know this, but baby zebras are not black and white. This is a baby zebra, and they're brown and white, and they lose the brown. And as they, uh, as they get a, a year or a year and a half old, they lose the brown, and it comes in as black. They're really cute, aren't they? I guess it is. I guess it keeps them better disguised in the brown. Because the grass is most of the time pretty much brown around there. It gets green during the rainy season. But you can see there's an awful lot of brown. Later on, I have a picture of a cheetah sitting in some green grass, which is just really unusual. He was right by a stream. And so it was green. That's really kind of pretty and unusual. This is, this is a gorgeous bird, not a particularly unusual bird. It's an African fish eagle. It's a big bird. It's almost the size of a uh, bald eagle, not quite as big. And you can't really see it very well here, but that's a catfish. Um, he's got a catfish in his talons, and he's taken off because we disturbed him. So he's going for other pastures to eat his, his, uh, his fish. This is uh, another leopard. This is a large male leopard. And again, it gives you some sense. He's, he's in one of those granite rock uh, outcroppings that we were looking at before, and that's his home. And uh, he's, this guy is sort of the king of that area. Um, he's a big male leopard. And uh, it's just gorgeous to see him sitting there. When you get an animal like this, you tend, this was in Tanzania in the Serengeti, you tend to attract other vehicles. The guides radio each other to let them know. Leopards are, are about the hardest animal other than rhinos to see because they're solitary hunters and they never are with another except if there's a baby. But other than that, they never are together in groups. And so they're very hard to find. And while he's on the rock, he's pretty easy to see. Uh, but when he gets down in the grasses, he's really hard to see. It's kind of surprising. You wouldn't think he'd blend in, but they do. Um, <laughs> this is a cute picture. Um, th these are, of course, Cape Buffalo, and that's an ox pecker. Uh, they're common there. Uh, th it's a symbiotic relationship with the, particularly the Cape Buffalo, but they also go on giraffes, and they pick uh, bugs off of them. And so the, the buffalo tolerate it because it keeps them clean. Uh, and it just was kind of funny seeing them sitting right on the head of this buffalo. Buffalo are also, the male Cape buffalo are notoriously bad-tempered animals, uh, and they're big. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. There's a 35-pound animal that actually can kill Cape buffalo. So this is an animal this big. Um, it's a honey badger. And have you ever heard of a honey badger? And honey badgers weigh 30 to 35 pounds, and they look like a badger. And they stand about five or well, maybe seven inches off of the ground and are about a foot and a half long. And they actually can kill a Cape buffalo. And the way they do it, they're supposedly the most ferocious animal pound for pound on Earth. The way they do it, 
is they go up under a male cape buffalo and they have incredibly sharp claws and they reach up and they rip open his testicles and then they follow him around until he bleeds to death and then they start eating him. But this is a little 35 pound animal. These male cape buffaloes can weigh up to 2000 pounds. It's, it's truly an amazing animal. Anyway, small piece of trivia you probably didn't want. Um, <laughs> this is another one of my truly favorite animals are the elephants. Um, and this was just a touching scene. This little baby couldn't get up that incline. And so this female came up. It could have been her, the baby's mother. It may have just been an aunt. Um, and came up behind it and pushed it up with its head so the baby could get up the incline. It was really a really sweet thing to watch. That's one of the nice things in Africa is watching moms and their kids. Uh, you know, it's just great to watch the interactions. Here's here's another one that just terrific. So these are wild dogs, and these are quite rare. There aren't many wild dogs left. They've mostly been shot by people. Um, and this is a mom, and she had 16 pups. I have some pictures of all 16 of them with her, and she's the alpha female in this pack. And these are just a few of them you can see here, but there are a whole bunch all around. And the whole pack helps to sort of contain these pups. Um, but uh, they're very rare now because they've been, they've been decimated by hunting. Um, but they, they're also supposedly a pack animals, the most ferocious hunters of any of the animals in the, uh, in, in Africa. Um, and, uh, it was really, it was thrilling to see this mom with her, with her pups. Now, this is, this is, this is probably my favorite wildlife picture maybe that I've ever taken. And that was this past summer. We had heard that there was a leopard hanging around, a male leopard. And we, we didn't know where he was. And we spent about three hours looking for this male leopard because finding a, a, a leopard is a big deal. Uh, they're hard to find. And all of a sudden, Fulgens, our, our guide, this was in Tanzania in the Serengeti, looked up in this tree and is right near us. We hadn't seen him. And there's this male leopard like this. And we stayed, we actually ate lunch here. And he just hung out there the whole time. And it was just one of those magical moments of being near him. He didn't care that we were there. He was not at all intimidated by us or disturbed by us. And he just hung there like that. He was just sleeping. A magnificent animal. Oh, man. What a beauty. Yeah, well, that's a, that, that was a topi. That's a, you know, an antelope related animal. You can tell by his horns there. And those are, that's his rib cage. And so this is the female, the rest of the pride. The male has already eaten and the alpha male is off on the side sleeping. And uh, there were 22 lions in this pride. It was a huge pride, a number of young ones. Um, and now the females, the grown females are eating. And then the younger ones will get to eat after the females eat. Um, yeah, it was vivid. <laughs> this is in Zimbabwe. And I, I just thought it was a neat shot. And he was selling these cloths. And these are, they're called sacred cloths. And women wear them in all kinds of ways. They wear them as dresses. They wear them to swaddle uh, babies in, and they're beautiful, uh, really colorful claws. And I just thought it was kind of cool seeing him there. <laughs> this was I, I just like the way these baboons were posed. Um, they were all kind of looking in the same direction and, you know, on their haunches like that. It was really cute. Baboons are very common there, and they're lots of fun to watch there very dedicated uh, troops of baboons that can be up to about 50 individuals. Um, what, what language? Well, in, in, uh, this, was in, this was in Tanzania. The native language is Swahili. 
Um, and in Uganda, uh, some of the pictures later on will be from Uganda, uh, there's English. That was a British territory. And so everyone speaks English there. Although in, in uh, Tanzania, most people speak some English, uh, but Swahili is the official language of Tanzania. Um, South Africa, of course, is English, uh, but the Afrikaners speak uh, the Afrikaner. Um, and Botswana uh, is now English. That was a British, also a British territory. Um, Zambia, same as English. Uh, so Tanzania and Rwanda. Rwanda, I forgot the name of the language that's the native language of Rwanda. A lot of them speak French because that was a French uh, uh, territory for a while. Um, this is just, I, I thought it was just a pretty setting with uh, uh, some young elephants. And you know, the these ele these elephant groups are all matriarchal. So males are only allowed to stay in these groups until they turn adolescent and then they're expelled. And so all adults in, in the, the uh, elephant herds are female. Uh, and there's an alpha female that leads the herd to water and to grazing. And, um, and the male, any males in the, in the group are young. Uh, and then they go off on their own. And the males are solitary. The males, the adult males live by themselves. The bull elephants live by themselves. And then they come into these groups and they mate with the females, but then they leave. They don't stay part of the family. And, and these families are very dedicated to each other. Do they? No, 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 there's, it's not monogamous. Um, this is just another picture, a different male, beautiful male that just loved his mane. Um, and just in the setting of, this is again in the Serengeti, um, and just placing him in his environment, I just thought was wonderful. Now, the, the next one is an animal that most people laugh at. My wife is actually very fond of this animal. Uh, this is a warthog, and this is a male warthog, and you can tell a male because these are the, what they call the warts, and the males have big warts. Um, and it looks like someone took these animals and just threw different parts on them, you know, threw a little hair here and there, threw these warts on, have these weird tusks. But interestingly, these guys, when they run, they stick their tail up in the air, and they run with their tail up like it's like it's it's a calling card to tell the predators where they are. You know, their tail is sticking up in the air. But lions will only eat, go after a warthog if they're desperate, if there's nothing else to eat, because they're so ferocious with those tusks. And they put their head down and jerk them up, and they can embed that tusk into their head. Uh, so lions will go after them if there's nothing else to eat, but they will not. That's not their first choice because they don't want that fight. They're they're little animals, but they're they they're pugnacious. <laughs> this is a gorgeous bird, the gray crowned cranes, um, and they're just beautiful. Uh, they're fairly common birds. They're very large. They stand about four feet high. Um, just magnificent birds. Um, again, I, I love the birds in Africa as elsewhere. Here are a couple of cheetahs and you're going to see. So this is, so we were in the vehicle and these guys are staring at us. I mean, there's absolutely no question that they're making eye contact and they're really curious. They're fascinated with us. There's never been a known attack of a cheetah on a human being. They, they're the smallest of the, of the big cats in Africa, and they, they do not attack humans. Um, it's, uh, there is no known attack of, by them. And, um, but they seem to have some affinity to humans, that they seem, uh, time and time again, we've run into cheetahs, and they love to stare at you. 
and they'll sit there and watch you for a while. Um, and the story is, you can always tell a cheetah, those are called the cry lines, those down their cheeks. The cheetahs have them, leopards don't. It's easy to mix up cheetahs and leopards, but um, these cry lines, and the, the mythology is that they're crying because they don't know if they're a cat or a dog. Um, and uh, they're, they're really magnificent animals. And these two guys, these are brothers, and you're gonna see them in the next two slides, these two brothers, because we were watching them and all of a sudden they got interested. There were some wildebeest not far away and they got interested in these wildebeest. And so we hung out there for about two and a half hours. And finally they went after the wildebeest and this is it. So that's one of them there. And you'll see the other one in a second, but to watch them chase down prey was an unbelievable experience. Here's, a, here's another shot of this guy. And look at him. He's completely airborne. And there's the other one. And his only job is to keep that wildebeest from running away that direction. And this guy's job is to jump on his back and get up to his neck. Um, this has a good ending for this wildebeest. He actually got away. Um, cheetahs are, are, while they're incredibly fast, and it's a thing of beauty to watch them run, they are notoriously bad for making kills. And they estimate that it's about one out of every 10 attempts they actually kill the animal. Um, and they can, you know, everyone, everyone probably knows that they, they can go from zero to 70 in three paces but they can only keep it up for about two or three seconds. You know, it burns up too much energy. And so they can't use that for long. And they don't, lions, you'll see lions creeping through the grass on their stomach, pulling themselves along, hiding. Cheetahs don't do that. Cheetahs just use their pure speed to run them down. But they've got to be close to the animal because they can't run for very long. They can't keep that pace up. It uses too much energy. Here's just a picture I like of two. Uh, so this, this guy is the male, and that's a female. You can tell by the rounded top of the horn there, and this is straight, and the fee, that's the female has the straight horn, and the male has the rounded crown on it. Here's another picture. This is a nice picture. Here's some giraffes. These are... These are very young, probably a week and a half, two weeks old. And you can see that's his umbilical cord right there. He still has his umbilical cord. Um, they're very sweet looking, aren't they? I, I love them. This is a very common bird in uh, all around Eastern and Southern Africa, the lilac breasted roller. And their colors are just spectacular. I have a, another picture of uh, one flying. I, they they captivate me with their colors. Uh, it's just gorgeous birds. Now, this is this is actually a story. Uh, you know, they talk about pictures telling a story. This is a story. So this is an old old bull elephant, and whoop 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 whoop. Sorry, that's not a bull elephant. This guy is. And this was taken at sunset, obviously. And that's, uh, there's another acacia tree right there. So this is right on the edge of the Chobe River in Botswana. And uh, I just thought it was such a symbolic setting. So he's a very old elephant. Elephants live through six sets of teeth. So they're herbivores, of course, and they grind. And they can grind big branches, uh, and they can grind grasses, and they have six sets of teeth. And when the sixth set of teeth is worn down from grinding, that's it. They don't have any more. And so what they do, what this guy did, is he went down to near the river where they have reeds because he couldn't eat the tougher grass and the branches anymore because he didn't have any teeth. And so he goes down there, and they're not very far away from death at that point. 
and they eventually starve to death because they can't get enough to eat without their teeth. Uh, and so it's kind of a sad thing with the sunset, and he's an old guy, uh, but such is nature. But I love that picture. It's a kind of sad but sweet picture. They what? No, no. They, you know, in none of these national parks in Botswana, Zambia, Tanzania, they never interfere with the animals. Um, they never provide medicine for them. Um, they don't rescue them, except from poachers, from humans, but not from other animals and not from normal diseases. This is a very unusual woodpecker. I've only seen one of him, a Nubian woodpecker. This was in the Ngorogoro crater. Uh, he's just a gorgeous, he was just on a, a termite mound here. And uh, just his coloring is just gorgeous. This is an interesting picture. Again, you get these moments when you're photographing where you see something that's not so common. And these are two young elephants in a herd who were separated for a while, and they're greeting each other. And they wrap their trunks around each other, and it's a social, it's a sh shaking hands, basically. And they're welcoming each other. It's, it's really kind of a cool thing to watch. Um, very human. Um, elephants are endlessly fascinating animals. This is a blue monkey, not a particularly common monkey. Uh, yeah, this is in Tanzania, uh, but I just love the expression on his face and the fact that I caught him eating. <laughs> These are fishers love birds, beautiful animals, um, just so colorful, fun, fun birds to watch. I bet everyone can guess what this is. That's a Nile crocodile. Um, it's quite a set of teeth they got on them. They're very common on the rivers. You see them everywhere. It really dissuades one from jumping in the river for a swim. Uh, they're all over. And, uh, you know, they, they, when you see them like this, he was just on the, on the banks of the river and he wasn't moving. You couldn't tell he was alive. There was no way you could tell he was alive. They just sit there for days, but uh, they are really, you'll see later how ferocious they are. This is, I, on one of my trips to Africa, this is in uh, um, Zambia um, on the river. One of my goals was to see a Malachite kingfisher. They're about three inches long. They're a very small bird and just magnificent colors. Um, I got to see about three or four. I got a couple of pictures of them in flight, but they're very fast and they weren't good photographs. Um, they weren't usable. Hmm. This is a cute picture. Most people don't know that there are penguins in Africa. This is uh, in the Cape Town area of South Africa. Uh, they do have uh, uh, a bunch of uh, African penguins. They're really cute little guys. They're about... Oh, 16, 18 inches tall. And they have a number of colonies of them there. I've done some portrait work. This is one of my favorite portraits I've ever taken. This is in the Hwenge village in uh, Zimbabwe. And this is Philip. And he's the patriarch of the village. And we were there visiting, and he was just hanging out. And he was a really cool guy. I talked to him for a while. I just got this shot of him, and it was something that just fascinated me about him. Yeah. yeah, this is a sad story. This is a golden monkey. There are actually fewer golden golden monkeys. This is in uh, Rwanda. There are fewer golden monkeys than there are gorillas. Uh, they used to be very common, and... <laughs> You can kind of tell he's in a farmer's field here, and it's a potato field. And <clears throat> golden monkeys have learned about potatoes, and they love them. And so they dig them up, 
And so they go into farmer's fields and they dig up potatoes and they eat them, of course. And so the farmers shoot them. And there are some, they estimate about a thousand golden monkeys left in the world uh, because they've all been shot uh, because they eat, uh, they eat uh, potatoes mostly. Uh, they're really beautiful monkeys, uh, just beautiful. But um, this is some of the sadness of the human interactions with uh, these magnificent animals. Uh, doesn't always work out well. This is also another fairly rare animal now because of their horns. Um, most of them have been killed, kudu, and their horns are just gorgeous. And their ears are pretty cool, too. Uh, but um, their horns are beautiful, and they've been killed for those horns. Uh, they've been decimated uh, for their horns. But here's a nice story. So this is this is a mama here, and these are actually twins. Uh, elephants rarely have twins; they usually only have one at a time for obvious reasons. And this is these weigh probably about two hundred and fifty pounds each. And so this mama had twins. Uh, that's uh, it's kind of cool. They look exactly alike. Uh, the 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 two babies, really cool. This is an unusual monkey, a black and white Colobus monkey. Uh, the, their hair is just unbelievable. It's very hard. I didn't get any great shots of this monkey. It's part of the problem of photography in Africa. They don't do a good job of posing sometimes. And Colobus monkeys aren't that common. And this was the best shot I could get. Uh, but you can get some idea of this luxurious tail that they have and this incredible hair on it. It's just amazing. Um, <clears throat> this is a, these are my favorite. These are the lilac breasted rollers. And this guy has a locust, but he was, he was trying to figure out how to eat that locust for at least 10 minutes. And it was just too big for him. And, you know, he couldn't figure out how to break it apart. And the other one's waiting for some leftovers and just hanging out there. But uh, it was uh, kind of whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, it was kind of a neat thing to watch him trying to figure out what to do with this locust that he had. So this is this is my friend Folgens, who is our guide, and we're in a Maasai village in Tanzania. Um, there are about a million Maasai left in both Kenya and Tanzania combined. Um, a lot of them have been killed off over the years or starved. Um, and uh, Folgens was our guide and he's our friend. Uh, we've been with him several times in Africa. This is kind of a sad story. Folgens is a wonderful person. We love him. And <clears throat> we decided as a, as a present for him, the thing that he had always wanted to do was see the United States. And so my wife and I told him that we would pay for him to come and visit with us and stay for a couple of weeks. And we'd take him around the United States. And he, he was beside himself. He was so happy. And uh, he got turned down for a visa. Um, he can't come. And there's nothing wrong. He's a totally honorable human being. He has a family. He has three children and a wife. He has a good job. And uh, he... I didn't realize this. I didn't know anything about it. To come to the United States, you have to go to a U.S. embassy and be interviewed. And he made a mistake on his application. He's a native Swahili speaker. Um, and he calls me Kaka, which doesn't mean what you think it means. So don't laugh. It means brother. And, um, and he made a mistake on the application. They found the mistake. It was just he put a wrong date in. And they denied his application on that. And, and he applied again. We paid for him to submit another application. And he went there, and they didn't even talk to him. They just denied it. Um, they don't want people like Fulgens coming to the United States because they don't believe he'll leave. Uh, they believe he'll stay here illegally. And there's no way Fulgens would have done that. We would have loved to have hosted him. It would have been a joy for us. Anyway, he's a he's a terrific guy. I, I'm in touch with him almost daily. Um, yeah, great guy. 
and these kids just loved him. Um, oh, yeah, you want to take yeah, five? Minutes. Sure, absolutely. Do it right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's take we're, a break. We're going to take a five minute break. So, everybody on Zoom, you can unmute yourselves if you'd like, and we'll be back shortly. If you have any questions at all, I'm happy to answer them. Questions? Sure. Did the birds migrate? The small birds? No, those are year round. Um, they are not migratory. Um, we're going to see some migratory animals coming up, uh, but they're not birds. No. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Yeah. Because you were staying. Okay. You said most of these photos are like a now, so it's kind well, of some are doing bright sunlight out of right. Uh, right. So you see most of the predators are some of the That's right. Where are you staying here? Here in the park. And most of the time we're in the park, <laughs> and they have they call them camps, and they're very level um, camps from pretty rustic tents to very elaborate. Thank you. Uh, and, but these aren't like tents you've ever seen. I mean, these are really fancy. They pull bathrooms inside. And, uh, so there's a huge range, and they're inside the park. Uh, it's, uh, there's, there's a huge range of places to stay. How well do they protect from these animals that would come and eat you while you're sleeping? Well, in a lot of the parks, uh, you're not allowed to walk outside at night by yourself. Right. They have escorts that are, um, they're, they're not armed. Well, they're armed usually with spears because you can't have firearms in most of the national parks. Zimbabwe in the national park, you can have firearms. But in, for example, the Serengeti, in the parks in Botswana and Zambia, you can't have firearms anywhere in the park um, because of poaching. You know, there's been so much poaching. And so, you know, you know, there's relatively little danger from these animals as long as you don't interfere with them. Um, but one of the camps we stayed in was actually contiguous with uh, a lion tribe. It was in one of those granite outcroppings. And, and that was a problem there. Day and night, you had to have an escort. The lions were all around. You saw them walking around all the time. And they were pretty acclimated to people. You know, they're, they're not prone to attack people. Again, if they're unprovoked. Um, but you, you do have to use some judgment, which I rarely have. <laughs> and, um, I, I mean, I, I try not, I don't want to disturb the animals. That, that's a big thing in Africa. You know, it's, you're sort of torn between whether you disturb the animals or you don't get close to them. And, you know, it's some balance that you're trying to achieve. Um, because being there is good for the animals because they, they cut down on poaching because they have a value to the country because of tourism. Um, but you don't want to make the animals miserable so that they can't live their lives. So it's it's one of those weird things. I wonder if they're that lion. I felt terrible about that. And actually, Fulgens was our guide there. And I talked to him about it. I never wanted to be in that situation where we disturbed an animal so much. He felt like he was going to have to attack us to protect himself. And it's just wrong to do that. Um, it's the only time I've ever done that. I once was taking a picture on my first African safari with Paul Elephant. And he was just standing right over there. And I had my camera, and I was really intent on you know, like getting a really beautiful close up of that big title photo. And so I'm walking up, and at one point, he just put his trunk up in the air, and he started flapping his ears and trumpeting. And I figured he wasn't happy. Um, I figured that out. And our guide on that trip said that that was the scariest moment that he had on our safari. He thought that elephant was going to charge. Um, yeah, well, you know, he, he could have gone 15 miles an hour. He was, <laughs> uh, he was a big bull elephant, and he was angry. And I was wrong. You know, I, I disturbed him too much. Um, I would never do that now. How often do you go? I've been there four times now. I'm not sure we're going to go back 
Uh, we may take our granddaughter, she's a little bit older, I'd love for to develop a love for these animals and the work and the capital. But it, it's a long trip. I'm getting older and it's a long flight. Uh, and, and once you get there, there's a, a lot of travel internally to get to the places you want to go. Often difficult travel. The roads are awful. There's lots of the national parks. Oh, I, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been life changing for me to be in Africa. And, you know, to have friends like Paul Newsom that stay in touch with all the time. I mean, well, no, he's just a wonderful person. And to get some sense of other cultures. And, and to learn about, you know, their religions and what their beliefs are. And it's, it's quite different than ours. And it's just a wonderful experience. Um, just wonderful. I've loved every minute of being in Africa. But there are a lot of places we still want to go to. We travel a lot. And uh, there, there are still places. That, and how do they feel about America's money to their country? Well, most places there. You know, I tell people we, we spent about a week in Uganda, which most people think of Idi Amin, they think of Uganda. And the people in Uganda were the friendliest human beings I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, they're poor, it's a, it's a terribly poor country, but the people were just wonderful. It was, it was just an incredible experience um, in Uganda. But we've had that everywhere. You know, people value tourism in most of the places we go because it supports them. Yeah. You know, so it's very important for the economy to be there or around the national parks. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the people and the families are supported by tourism there. So, you know, it's uh, we, we've never we've never had an unpleasant experience with people from the, their country. Some of the tourists are idiots. I mean, we've run into some truly idiotic tourists, but um, never had a bad experience. And we've had some, contrary to that, we've had some wonderful experiences with people. Um, we got pulled over in Uganda by a cop. We were with a guy who was driving our vehicle. And this cop was, turns out, Eric is his name, in case you're interested. <laughs> and he was a 23-year-old guy. He pulled us over to check papers to make sure our driver had the proper papers. Pulls us over, he looks in the back seat, and he saw that we were Americans. And so he, he, he we, we ended up talking to him for an hour and a half. We want to know all that And so he said to us, at one point, he's just the nicest guy. And I kept that email exchange up with him for a long time. And at one point, he said, you know, when I think about it, both Uganda and the United States have been doing pretty well since they separated from Great Britain. <laughs> Probably the only time in my life that anyone ever compared the yeah. United States. You know, it's correct. It's one of those just incredible moments. Uh, should, should we get going again? Sure. One place to go for the first Oh, my God. In Africa or anywhere in, in the world? In Africa. Oh, my God. It's a hard one. Tanzania, I love. The Serengeti is spectacular. Just spectacular. Um, but Botswana, Botswana is a wonderful country. Uganda, uh, Rwanda, and, you know, it's really hard. Probably, if I took my granddaughter back, I'd probably go to Tanzania again. All right, we're going to get started again. I want to see Holger, our friend, and have him guide us and my granddaughter. Um, I don't know. It's, it's That's a real tough one. Oh, man. And when you go with him, are there other people in your group, or is it just... Yeah, we, we, my wife and I have never gone by ourselves, but the last two times with Holgins, it's just been our friends. We've gone with a, one or two other couples. Um, and we once went on a bigger group trip uh, with 16 people. There were 10 of us in our group, but there were six other people. <coughs> that had its advantages and disadvantages. Excuse me. Uh, so, all right. Well, and feel free to interrupt anytime. You know, it's uh, we're we're not far from the end. So this was just kind of a neat lake, uh, just loaded with flamingos, and that one guy was flying, and just not a particularly good picture. But again, it was midday, 
uh, harsh shadows, brilliant white light, um, not, not ideal conditions. Uh, this, is, this is on the edge of the Mara River. I couldn't resist this. These are, they're called little bee eaters. And there are two of them there. And they had kind of a cool expressions on their faces. And I just thought it was just neat. And they're beautiful little birds. They're probably four inches long or so. Little, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I have no idea if it's just a younger one or a female. Don't know. Yeah. Uh, they have some extravagant nest makers. This is one of them. It's a white-headed buffalo weaver. And um, they make these extravagant hanging nests. That's why they're called weavers. Uh, just, just magnificent. Um, that right. That this is a thorny acacia, right? Yeah, it doesn't have its leaves out because it's their winter. But those are the thorns that the good pickup on that. Thank you. Um, and uh, and it doesn't have its leaves out because it's winter. But that's what the giraffes pick the leaves off of. It's unbelievable. Those things are ferocious. Those thorns. So here we're going to right up here. This is the Mara River that runs right here. And that's where we're going because we were talking about migration. We're going to take a few slides and look at uh, what's often called the Great Migration, which is the largest mammal migration on Earth. Um, and so this is the path. The migration is actually continually going on. And this is the path that they follow. And it's about 2 million wildebeests and also some zebras go with them. And they simply follow the rains because they're grazers. And so they the rains come and they follow where the rains have been so the grass is green and growing. And interestingly, wildebeests have babies and the babies are able to run after 10 minutes after birth because uh, they don't they don't stay anywhere long. They keep moving. Um, and uh, they're amazing animals. They're not the prettiest animals. Often the British call them gnus. Um, and the wildebeests are um, uh, so so we're up at the Mara River. And one of the things that is really amazing to watch is when a river gets in their way of their migration. They have to cross the river. And that's a time of great peril for them. And uh, we'll see that now. So these are all wildebeests here. And they're massing on the Tanzanian side of the Mara River. The other side essentially goes to Kenya. Um, and they're massing here. This is a tiny fraction of them, of the two million but it goes on and on and on. And then what they do is they move toward, they're heading here, they're heading north, and they move toward the river, which is the impediment for them. And so the predators know this is happening. And so this is a female lion. These are the wildebeests. And she's just scouting, looking for old or lame wildebeests. And this is the only time in Africa I've ever seen animals kill for pleasure. And you'd see lions, mostly females, because they do the majority of the hunting, um, just kill because they could. And they would kill a wildebeest and then just move on and leave it there. Um, I'd never seen that before. They always eat what they kill, but not at this time. So. Wait a second. You're... Did you see my presentation already? So this is the Mara River here, and they're actually crossing, heading north toward Kenya here on this on this particular time of the year when we were there. And so this this gives you some sense. This is this is one of my favorite pictures of the, and it's yeah, it's just their horns basically. And um, 
They'll stand at the edge of the river and 10, 20, 30,000 of them will back up. And then all of a sudden, one of them will cross the river and they all, this is mass chaos going across the river. Well, the river at different parts, the some places it's over their head and they have to swim uh, in the center of the river in most of the areas it is. There are a couple of crossings that they, some areas they cross where they're never in over their head. But uh, here you'll see that, oh, we're not getting the sound. Darn it. I don't, I don't know how to do that. Let's. I'm not sure I know how to get the sound. Um, whoop. Let me go back. I, I, don't, I don't know that I can do anything to get the sound. Um, but that gives you the sense of the thunder. Uh, it's just unbelievable. The, uh, whoop. I'm sorry. The, it's, it, whoop. I'm doing this badly, sorry. Um, yeah, there's this. You have any idea if we can add the sound to it? Is his laptop muted? His laptop is muted. Yeah, microphone's, microphone's off. But I, Go ahead. I, let me just see. Can, I don't know. Yes. You're not getting the effect. Yeah, I don't think there's anything I can really do, but the ground shakes, the noise is overwhelming um, when they're doing this crossing. Uh, it's it's just an unbelievable, it's dusty. Uh, they're they're baying the the wildebeests are, and it's overwhelming. It's really quite an experience. Uh, we've been there twice during the Great Migration. And this is a picture of them jumping in to swim across the river. And of course, the lions are there, the leopards are around, and the crocodiles know, and the crocodiles amass. And this is that. So here's about a 20 foot crocodile, and he's latched onto the hind leg of that wildebeest. We watched this for about 25 minutes. It was absolutely awful to watch that that wildebeest is just trying to get up on shore and that crocodile just isn't letting go and he's just not going to let go and eventually the wildebeest got exhausted and the crocodile pulled them out into the center of the river and drowned them um, it was really painful to watch but that's what happens so this is that picture I told you about before of the cheetah in the grass. And it's such a nice contrast to see that beautiful green grass near a, a, a little uh, a creek uh, and this gorgeous cheetah. And again, looking right into my camera, uh, is often what they do. So just neat experience. And this is a white-headed kingfisher. Uh, another beautiful bird. I have literally hundreds of pictures of birds in Africa. I couldn't overwhelm you with all of them. Um, there's another female leopard. Beautiful animals, huh? And when they're sitting like this, it's easy to get good photographs, you know? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Apologize. Yeah, it's... Um, it, it's when they're posing like this, it's just a pleasure to take pictures. It's easy. Even I can get a good picture. Here's another one of my favorite flying birds. This is the lilac breasted roller again. And I think. Uh, um, just the colors are just spectacular. The lilac throat and the different shades of blue are just cool. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, good. I can uh, quickly. Uh, this was taken with, I use all Nikon equipment. Um, and yeah, let's hear it for Nikon. Yay, Nikon. 
Um, oh no, a cannon person. Um, so um, this was taken with a 500, the, the newer lens, the 5.6, 500 millimeter PF. Yeah, uh, I love that lens, by the way. It's a terrific lens. I also have the 80 to 400, the newer version uh, of the zoom lens, uh, the 80 to 400, which is a pretty good lens, actually. I like that. Um, and then I have a 24 to 70, the Nikon 24 to 70. And I'll show you some pictures of that just coming up now of the 24 to 70 uh, where the wider angle. Um, and then I had a 70 to 200, but I didn't end up using that a whole lot. Um, a lot of these are shot with long lenses. Uh, you know, if, if anyone's going to Africa, I would never recommend not having anything at, at least 300 millimeters, 400 to 500 is better because um, some things just aren't that close. But you don't need to worry much about, you know, um, having a really fast lens. Uh, five, six is fine uh, because, you know, usually it's pretty bright sunlight. <clears throat> this is the only rhino I've ever seen in the wild. Um, it's a black rhino. And um, this was in uh, the Serengeti, actually. Uh, there are very few. There are 30 or 40 rhinos in the Serengeti. We were very lucky to see this guy. Um, you know, they've all been shot. Um, they, they've had a terrible time. They're still being shot, you know, uh, for the horn, you know, they grind the horn, you know, the Chinese think it's an aphrodisiac. So they kill them. Um, so there are very few rhinos left. It's a very sad story. This is a nice shot of a long crested eagle, a beautiful bird. Here's a, this is the only one of these I've ever seen. This was this past summer. It's a puff adder. <laughs> They're responsible for more human deaths than any other snake in Africa. Um, they have a moderately deadly bite. Uh, it's not as bad a bite as the black mamba, uh, but I've never seen a black mamba there. I wish I did. Although my guide, Fulgens, in Serengeti has seen one, and he said, oh, thank you. He said, he, he, he saw, he said, the thing, what they do is they can get up to 13 or 14 feet long, the mambas, and they rise up. And if they strike you, they hit you in your chest. And they've got a, a terrible toxin. Um, I forgot I had read about it. But anyway, I've never seen one. I told him I really wanted to see one. He said, no, you don't. Um, he said, you do not want to see a mamba. But we did see this puff adder on the last trip, which is pretty cool. It was in a road. Uh, thank you. So we're going to go on a little detour here. We're going to. So this is the this is the most aptly named place on Earth. It's called the Windy Impenetrable Forest of Uganda. And this is where the mountain gorillas hang out. And it's one of the least hospitable places I've ever been to go for a hike. Um, it's it's incredible, this jungle, how dense it is and how wet it is and how miserable it is. Um, but in Uganda, that's where you go if you want to see gorillas. And so on one of our trips to Africa, we went to both Uganda and Rwanda, which are contiguous to each other. And the areas of the gorillas in Rwanda are the Volcanoes National Park, which is very close to the windy and penetrable forest. Um, but it's it's such an aptly named place. It was incredible. It was about two and a half hours to get to where you get assigned a family. It's all very tightly controlled. And you go with a national park ranger and there are eight people in each group. And you hike until you find your family of gorillas. In, in Bwindi, there are eight families that are used to people that are acclimated to humans that you can go visit. So every day, they allow eight people to go to each of the eight families. And you get to, as soon as you see the first gorilla in the family, you have exactly one hour. There's no debating that. There's no nothing. After an hour, you leave and that's it. 
because they don't want to disrupt the lives of the gorillas too much. Um, and so we walked for two and a half hours through this jungle. And this is, you know, this is where the there were two guides and a national park ranger with us. And the guides were, you know, this was with machetes to clear a path. And it's going up and down hills through mud. And um, it's, it's really uh, an incredible challenge. Um, but uh, the payoff was unbelievable. The, the hour that we spent in, in Uganda and the hour in Rwanda were probably the two most amazing hours of my life. Um, just unbelievable. So this is a mom with her two-month-old baby. Um, and, you know, if you don't think they're related to us, I mean, you see this mother protecting her baby. Uh, it's just unbelievable. Um, and you're not allowed to approach within 20 feet of a gorilla, but they come up to you, particularly the younger ones will come up. They're just curious and, you know, they'll come up and look around and one of them rolled, it was playing on the ground, rolled into my wife's leg. Um, it's just an amazing experience to be with these animals. There's no sense of threat or danger at all. Um, and uh, this is a two-year-old, and he was just up on a tree playing. He was swinging around. He was just having a ball. And, you know, absolutely could have been a human child up there doing exactly the same thing. He was a little bit more adept than most human child children would be in trees. So in, in Rwanda, this is, in our group, Mahuza was the male. He was the silverback of our group that we went to see in Rwanda. And this, this is Mahuza. And he is truly an intimidating animal. There was nothing threatening about him at all. Just his size. He weighs 450 pounds. And uh, unfortunately, oh, maybe, maybe we can get the sound on this. Um, this is, this is, yeah, oh, you muted it? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. That's not fucking good. Well, uh, okay, I muted. I muted again. Um, you know, I don't know. I I never saw him. I'm. This isn't playing properly. Yeah. You know, he's probably, if he stands on his hind legs, he's probably about five feet tall, maybe. Weighs 450 pounds. He's got a huge belly on him. Um, he's not particularly someone I'd want to fight, I don't think. Um, but, you know, gorillas are not aggressive animals at all. Unless they're threatened, they never attack, ever. Um, this is a mother... I just, uh, her face was just, one. I loved her face. And this is in, uh, this is in Uganda. Uh, this is Mashaya, and he's the silverback of the group we saw there. We walked for two and a half hours each way in Uganda, and the family, his family, Mashaya's family, were all in this dense jungle. So you could see him through all of these leaves and stuff. Couldn't get any pictures of them except him. I got him. Uh, and uh, he's an impressive looking guy. So anyway, and that's it. That's the back end of Messiah. Messiah. So we have come to the end of this. And in Swahili, Santa Sana is thank you very much. Are there any questions? If there's any questions online, you guys can unmute yourselves and ask them. You what? Oh, okay. I'm sorry? No, probably not. Um, Although that little Malachite kingfisher was one quick little guy, 
but probably not as fast as hummingbirds. And I did get a couple of pictures of, of them flying, but they just weren't really usable. Um, yeah, right. They'd be equivalent like of a barn swallow trying to shoot them. You know, they can be pretty tough to get them in flight. You know, I've, I've never seen a hummingbird there. I never did. They very well may, but I never saw one. That was a good question. Um, you know, if, if anyone knows or is interested in going to Africa, I'm happy to give sort of the benefit of my experience there. Um, and I you know I spent a fair amount of time in Africa now. And um, I'm happy to help with anyone uh, who has any interest in going. We've, my wife and I have helped a number of people. Oh, fine. Well, you know, the, the answer to that question is, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is it is it better to go in the winter or summer? We have always been in their winter, which is our summer. Uh, and there's one big reason is because I have never seen a mosquito when I've been there. And in the in in their summertime, it's loaded with mosquitoes. And, you know, the mosquitoes still carry some bad things there. And so we go to avoid the mosquitoes. And it's drier in, in their winter, um, in July and August, in most of the areas we've been to, is their dry season. So that's also nice. It's a sunny, dry season. It's not as hot. The daytime temps would get up to 75, 80 high, which is lovely. And at night, it would get down to 40s. Uh, in the summertime, in their summertime, it gets up to, depending on where you are, it can get up to 105, 110, and very humid. Uh, so we've never been at that time of year, uh, simply because I don't want the mosquitoes. You know, malaria is still a real issue there. Uh, so you have to take an anti-malarial. Although when we've been there in, in their winter, there really wasn't any need. We didn't need to. I never got bit by a mosquito. I never saw one. I would. <laughs> they love me. Um, yeah, they they recommend the usual, the hepatitis shots, which are recommended for almost any travel, and uh, typhoid, uh, typhoid fever. And in Botswana, you can drink the water from the tap. Uh, that's the only country that I've been to. Well, like in Cape Town, you could. Uh, but in most of the countries, you cannot drink the tap water. Uh, it's it's You can't even use it for brushing your teeth. Um, which is a problem in itself because what they end up doing is the countryside is littered with plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. It's, it's all, uh, you know, to see these pristine environments just trashed with plastic bottles from mostly from water like this. John, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. I, I, oh, me? Yeah, so. yeah you, John. Yeah, uh, have you ever been on the West Coast, uh, Namibia? You know, we've been in Namibia briefly, just crossing over the border. It's one of the places I would love to go is the Skeleton Coast. Um, I would love to see Atosha National Park in Namibia and the Skeleton Coast. Um, and maybe at some point we'll get there, but we don't have a, we don't have a plan to travel there right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Skeleton Coast, I've seen pictures of it on on uh, the coast of Namibia is, is really wife, quite a spectacular place. Have you been wife, there? My, <laughs> no, my wife, Pat, has seen some photos from National Geographic mm -hmm. and Stuff. Yep. Discovery, and she, she's also, just dying to go. <laughs> I want to take the Shongalolo train, which goes around Namibia. That's something that's a little different. Huh. I, I don't know about that. Well, that goes um, out of the UK. It doesn't go out of here. Yeah. But Namibia is, is a country, again, it's a safe country and people rave about it. Uh, they have a lot of cheetahs there, too. It's got the largest cheetah population in the world. Yeah. Thank um, you. Other Chris? questions? Chris? Yeah. I'm online. Yeah. My, my name is Lynn. Your pictures Hi, are Lynn. 
absolutely amazing and beautiful. The oh. wildebeest pictures are the best I've ever seen. Oh. Fabulous. Well, th thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? If you, you know, my website is up there. It's my, just my www.chrisgossip.com. And I have more, lots more African pictures there. Although I have probably 40,000 pictures from Africa. They're not all, they're not all up there. And um, pictures from all over the world. Uh, we've traveled pretty extensively. And so, you know, if you want to spend, waste a little time, um, you're welcome to do it. And you can download any of these pictures. They're free. You can use them any way you want. I, you know, if they bring people pleasure, that's why I take them. Um, I don't care about the copyright stuff. Doesn't mean anything to me. All right. I want to thank you. It was a good meeting. Thank you. Lots of good information. Hopefully well, we'll see you again soon. Thank you for having me. That concludes our meeting this evening. And uh, if you guys online want to stay online, that's fine. Uh, we're going to turn this off here and start packing up. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to do this. And uh, I hope I hope it gives some appreciation for the beauty of Africa and the animals there. And it's an amazing place. Thank you for having me.